This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. We begin today's show with the acclaimed Russian-American writer Masha Gessen, scheduled to receive the prestigious Hannah Arendt Prize in Germany today. But the ceremony had to be postponed after one of the award sponsors, the left-leaning Heinrich Boll Foundation, withdrew its support for the prize after Masha Gessen compared Gaza to the Warsaw Ghetto in a recent article for The New Yorker titled, In the Shadow of the Holocaust. How the politics of memory in Europe obscures what we see in Israel and Gaza today. The German city of Bremen also withdrew the venue where today's prize ceremony was scheduled to take place. In the essay, Masha Gessen wrote, quote, For the last 17 years, Gaza has been a hyper-densely populated, impoverished, walled-in compound where only a small fraction of the population had the right to leave for even a short amount of time, in other words, a ghetto. Not like the Jewish ghetto in Venice or an inner-city ghetto in America, but like a Jewish ghetto in an Eastern European country occupied by Nazi Germany. Masha Gessen went on to write about why the term ghetto is not commonly used to describe Gaza. They wrote, quote, presumably the more fitting term ghetto would have drawn fire for comparing the predicament of besieged Gazans to that of ghettoized Jews. It also would have given us the language to describe what's happening in Gaza now. The ghetto is being liquidated. Masha Gessen's essay sparked some outrage in Germany, and its announcement withdrawing support for Gessen's prize, the Heinrich Boll Foundation, which is tied to the German Green Party, criticizes Gessen's essay, saying it, quote, implies that Israel aims to liquidate Gaza like a Nazi ghetto, unquote. While the foundation pulled out of the Hannah Arendt Prize ceremony, a smaller ceremony will take place Saturday at a different venue. For Gessen, the controversy in Germany comes just days after being added to Russia's most wanted list for comments they made about the war in Iraq, in, in Ukraine. Masha Gessen joins us now from Bremen, Germany. Masha Gessen is staff writer at The New Yorker, author of numerous books, including most recently Surviving Autocracy. Welcome back to Democracy Now!, Masha, if you can start off by talking about this controversy, talking about what you wrote in The New Yorker magazine, and the fact that, well, the ceremony hasn't been completely canceled, but just explain what's happened. Hi, Amy. It's good to be here. Um, I don't know that I can fully explain what happened, because I don't think I quite understand what happened, um, because the Heinrich Bill Foundation first withdrew from the prize ceremony, um, causing the city of Bremen to withdraw from the prize ceremony, causing the prize organizers to tell me that, first of all, they stand by me uh, and by their decision to give me the prize, but also to, uh, oh, and then the university where the discussion the day after the prize was supposed to be held also withdrew. Uh, and this is interesting because the university said that they believed that having the discussion would violate a law. Now, by the law, I think what they actually meant was the non-binding resolution uh, that bans uh, uh, anything connected with the boycott, div uh, divestment, sanctions movement, uh, which is non-binding but has a huge influence in Germany, um, and that was largely the topic of my of my article. So then the prize organizers. Uh, decided to have a smaller ceremony at a different location, which I'm not going to mention, not because I'm afraid of Germans, but because I'm concerned about Russians. Uh, and um, and then the Heinrich Bill Foundation, after quite an uproar in, in German social media and, uh, and conventional media, issued a new statement saying that they stand by the prize, but the venue had canceled, so they couldn't hold this award ceremony, so it was postponed. Uh, which I don't think was entirely um, forthcoming on the part of the Heinrich Bill uh, Foundation, and their first statement was on record. But that's where we stand now. So let's talk about the heart of what the Heinrich Bull Foundation has found so controversial. Talk about this piece that you wrote for The New Yorker magazine, the comparison you've made to Gaza and the Warsaw Ghetto. 
So the piece is fairly wide ranging. It's it's a piece in which I traveled through Germany, Poland, and Ukraine, and talk about the politics of memory in each country. But a large part of the piece, uh, and, and how we view the current war in Israel-Palestine through the prism, or fail to view the war through the prism of the Holocaust. Um, a large part of the article is devoted to, in fact, memory politics in Germany and the vast anti-anti-Semitism machine, which largely targets people who are critical of Israel and, in fact, are often Jewish. This happens to be a description that fits me as well. I am Jewish. I come from a family that includes Holocaust survivors. I grew up in the Soviet Union very much in the shadow of the Holocaust. Um, that's where the phrase in the headline came from, is, is, is from that passage in, 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 in the article itself. Uh, and I am critical of, of Israel. Now, the part that really offended the Henry Bill Foundation uh, and the city of Bremen, and I would imagine some German public, is the part that you read out loud, which is where I make the comparison between the, the besieged Gaza, so Gaza before October 7th, and a Jewish ghetto in Nazi-occupied Europe. Um, I made that comparison intentionally. It was not a, um, what they call here, a provocation. Uh, it was very much the point of the piece, because um, I think that the way that memory politics function now in Europe and in the United States, but particularly in Germany, is that the cornerstone is that you can't compare the Holocaust to anything. It is a singular event that stands outside of history. My argument is that in order to learn from history, we have to compare. Like that actually has to be a constant exercise. We are not better people or smarter people or more educated people than the people who lived 90 years ago. The only thing that makes us different from those people is that in their imagination, the Holocaust didn't yet exist, and in ours it does. We know that it's possible. And the way to prevent it is to be vigilant in the way that Hannah Arendt, in fact, and other Jewish thinkers who survived the Holocaust were vigilant and were, uh, there was an entire conversation, especially in the first two decades after World War II, in which they really talked about how to recognize the signs of sliding into the darkness. Um, and I think that we need to, oh, and one other thing that I, that I wanna say is that our entire framework of international humanitarian law is essentially based, uh, it, it all comes out of the Holocaust, uh, as does the concept of genocide. And I argue that the, the, that framework is based on the assumption that you're always looking at war, at conflict, at violence, through the prism of the Holocaust. You always have to be asking the question of whether crimes against humanity, the definitions of which came out of the Holocaust, are occurring. And Israel has waged an incredibly successful campaign at setting its, uh, not only setting the Holocaust outside of history, but setting itself aside from the optics of international humanitarian law. Uh, in part by weaponizing the politics, uh, the politics of memory, the politics of the Holocaust. So talk more about that, that learning about the Holocaust through the idea that it is separate and apart and can be compared to nothing else versus how we ensure never again anywhere for anyone. I don't know that we can ensure it never again anywhere for anyone, but I think the only way to try to ensure it uh, is to keep knowing that the Holocaust is possible. Uh, keep knowing that it is it it it, it can come out of what Aaron called shallowness. Uh, I mean, this was very much her point in uh, in in Eichmann in Jerusalem, a report on the banality of evil. And by the way, uh, this was a book that got Arendt really ostracized by um, both the Israeli political mainstream and much of the North American Jewish political mainstream for things that she wrote about the Judenrat, but also for this very 
framing of the banality of evil. Uh, it was misinterpreted as, as trivializing the Holocaust. But what she was saying is that the most horrible things of which humanity has proven capable can grow out of something that seems like nothing, can grow out of thoughtlessness, can grow out of the failure to see the fate of the other uh, or just or the inability to see it. Um, and I interpret that as a as a call to constant vigilance for failure to see the fate of the other, for um, for doubting the uh, the kind of overwhelming consensus that certainly in Israel and in the North American Jewish community appears to back the, the, the Israeli onslaught on Gaza. This is the way in which we stumble into our darkest moments. For people uh, who don't know who Hannah Arendt is, uh, the Jewish philosopher, political theorist, the, or, uh, the author of The Origins of Totalitarianism and the Human Condition, The Banality of Evil, as well, covered the Eichmann trial for The New Yorker magazine, the magazine that Masha Gessen writes for. Masha, last week, an Israeli airstrike in Gaza City killed the acclaimed Palestinian academic, the activist, the poet, Rafat al arayir along with his brother, his sister, and his four nieces. For more than 16 years, al arayir worked as a professor of English literature at the Islamic University of Gaza, where he taught Shakespeare and other subjects, the father of six, a mentor to so many young Palestinian writers and journalists. He co-founded the organization We're Not Numbers. In October, Democracy Now! spoke to Rafat al who also compared Gaza to the Warsaw Ghetto. If you have seen the pictures from Gaza, we speak about complete devastation and destruction to universities, to schools, to mosques, to businesses, to clinics, to roads, infrastructure, to water lines. Uh, if I googled this morning uh, Warsaw Ghetto pictures, and I got pictures I couldn't differentiate. Somebody tweeted four pictures and asked to to tell which one is from Gaza and which one is is from the Warsaw Ghetto. They are remarkably the same because the perpetrator is almost using the same strategies against. Uh, a minority against uh, the oppressed uh, the people, the battered uh, people, the besieged uh, people, whether it was in uh, Warsaw Ghetto, the Jews in Warsaw Ghetto in the past, or Palestinian Muslims and Christians in uh, in the Gaza in the Gaza Strip. So uh, the, the similarity is uncanny. That was the Palestinian poet, writer, and professor Rafat al Adir, who was killed in Gaza by an Israeli airstrike that killed his brother, sister, and four of her daughters. This is Scottish actor Brian Cox, famous for Succession, just nominated for uh, a number of Emmys, um, reading Rafat al Adir's poem, If I Must Die, in a video that's gone viral. If I must die. You must live to tell my story, to sell my things, to buy a piece of cloth and some strings. Make it white with a long tail so that a child somewhere in Gaza while looking heaven in the eye, awaiting his dad who left in a blaze and bid no one farewell, not even to his flesh, not even to himself, sees the kite my kite you made flying up above and thinks for a moment an angel is there bringing back love if i must die let it bring hope let it be a tale scottish actor brian cox reciting rafat al arir's poem if i must die in a video produced by the palestine festival of literature palfest uh, Masha Gessen, if you can comment on both what Rafat and you are saying about the Warsaw Ghetto and the significance of him dying in this strike. Like so many other Palestinians, I think the number as we speak, we're at something like 19,000 Palestinians dead, more than 7,000 children, more than 5,000 women, Masha. 
I, I wasn't aware that he had made this comparison, um, but I'm not particularly surprised because the comparison lies on the surface. And so the question I had to ask when writing this, it was why, uh, why hadn't this comparison been made before? The trope that's that's been used for at least a dozen years in sort of human rights circles is open air prison. An open air prison is not a good descriptor for what was in what was Gaza before October seventh. If there are no prison cells, there are no prison guards. There's no regimented schedule, uh, daily schedule. What there was was isolation. What there was was a wall. What there was was um, uh, the inability of people to to leave, except, except with the exception of very very few. What there was was a local force, enabled in part by the people who built the wall, and I'm talking about Hamas now as the local force that maintained order, uh, and in this way serviced in part the needs of the people who built the the, uh, the wall. Right. That was that was the bargain that Israel had struck by pulling out of Gaza, was that Hamas would maintain order there. And um, and obviously there are huge differences. I'm not claiming by any means that uh, this is a one to one comparison or that even there is such a thing as a one to one comparison. That's not a thing. Um, but I'm, what I'm arguing is that this different the similarities are so substantial they, they can actually inform our understanding of what's happening now. And what's happening now, and this is probably the line in the piece that made a lot of people throw their laptops across the room, uh, what's happening now is that the ghetto is being liquidated. And I think that's an important thing to say, not just because it's important to call things, to describe things in the best possible way that we can, um, but because, again, in the name of never again, we have to ask if this is like a ghetto, and if what we're witnessing now in this indiscriminate killing, in this, in, in, in an onslaught that has displaced almost all the people of Gaza, and that has made them homeless, if that is substantially similar to what we saw in some places during the Holocaust, then what is the world going to do about it? What is the world going to do in the name of never again? Masha Gessen, the cancellations of speeches, of festivals um, that are seen as pro-Palestinian are on the rise. Um, you have taught at Bard for years. You know the kind of pressure that professors and students are being brought under all over uh, the United States. You're in Germany right now. I'm wondering if you can comment on this. Some are calling it a new McCarthyism. And yet, interestingly, like you, so many of the protesters are Jews, are Jewish students, Jewish professors. But when your this ceremony was first canceled and postponed, what kind of response did you get from the press? Was it an avalanche of interest? And especially in Germany now, where people like Greta Thunberg, right, the young climate activist, spoke up for Gaza and got pilloried in the German press. Well, it's funny you should ask, because I was uh, making my way to Bremen uh, after having woken up to an email telling me that, uh, that this was all going on. And I started seeing media reports that were wildly inaccurate. They said, for example, that that the price had been rescinded, which it never was. The jury uh, was very firm, and I uh, and I can't say enough to express my appreciation for them. I can, uh, I think they've shielded me from uh, how much pressure they've come under uh, as a result of this controversy. But I felt so. Sort of well hosted and, and supported by them. But, but yeah, the media were uh, reporting all sorts of things and also making up biographical uh, facts about me. And in all that time, not a single German reporter contacted me, and only one US reporter contacted me, uh, the, a reporter from the Washington Post. So I tweeted about it. And it was like I reminded journalists that that's what we do, is we call people and find out what actually happened. So I have been talking to the media now nonstop for the last uh, 
28 hours. Uh, I'm, I almost wish I hadn't tweeted it, but I also think it's very important to try to um, to try to have this conversation in a meaningful way. So I've been concentrating mostly on German media. Uh, every single German media outlet I've ever heard of has reached out to me. So I don't think it's that they, did, they didn't want to give me a voice. It's that um, the habit of aggregating the news has just become so ingrained that people forget that, um, that the substance of our profession is to actually call people and ask them. Go to where the silence is. Uh, Masha Gessen, I also want to ask you about another issue. Russian police recently placed you on a wanted list after opening a criminal case against you on charges of spreading false information about the Russian army. The Kremlin's accusing you of spreading uh, false information over your remarks about the massacre of Ukrainian civilians by Russian forces in the city of Bucha in March of last year. Can you comment? Um, well, it's been quite a week. Uh, I, uh, I, 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 I kind of feel like I want to stop making news. But, um, but you know what? I, it's not crazy to me that uh, I'm both placed by on the Russian wanted list and uh, running into trouble with German authorities, because. I think that there's there's a kind of politics, and that's and this is what you referred to in uh, in the first part of your earlier question, which is you know the thing that some people are referring to as the new McCarthyism. This is to me the most worrying part of uh, of domestic Western politics, uh, both here and in the United States, that the right wing is riding the horse of anti anti Semitism. In Germany, the IFD, which is the far-right uh, anti-immigrant party, has been using uh, anti-Semitism as a cudgel to um, uh, both as a ticket into the political mainstream and as a cudgel against uh, a lot of uh, the anti-Israeli anti policy voices, many of which belong to Jews. And um, and I think that the uh, what we what we have observed with the university presidents being called into Congress in uh, in the United States is has has definite similarities. It is also uh, Elise Stepanek's ticket into the uh, into the political limelight and political mainstream. But it also and this is the really important part. It is also based on a profoundly anti-Semitic world view. Um, Elise Stefanik is using uh, these university presidents to uh, to attack liberal institutions, to attack Ivy League universities, and I think in her imagination, and we I think we know enough to know that this is how her, her imagination is working. She is trying to get uh, donors to withdraw funding to undermine these institutions, and of course, in her imagination, the Jews control all the money, so the donors are Jewish. This is the most sort of basic anti-Semitic trope. And, um, and the fact that uh, the, the right is able to hijack the issue of anti-Semitism so effectively is truly dangerous because you know what? Anti-Semitism is real. Anti-Semitism, uh, when, when uh, right-wing politicians or stupid politicians Mix actual anti-Semitism with fake anti-Semitism, with what in Germany they called Israel-related anti-Semitism, which is basically criticism of Israel. Um, what we end up with is a muddled picture in which Jews are being used, an anti-Semitic worldview is being reaffirmed, and ultimately actual real anti-Semitism becomes a bigger danger. And I wanted to end with another victim of the Holocaust, the LGBTQ community. Russia's Supreme Court recently banned LGBTQ plus activism in a landmark decision. Amnesty International blasted as shameful and absurd. The ruling, which asserts the international LGBTQ movement is extremist, threatens to further endanger already persecuted communities. Masha, isn't that part of the reason you left the Soviet Union, you left Russia to begin with? We just have a minute, but if you could comment. Yes, I left. I'm, uh, next week is 10 years since I was forced to leave Russia because uh, of the anti-gay campaign that was already underway in, um, in Russia, and the Kremlin was threatening to go after my family. 
Well, Masha Gessen, we thank you so much for joining us, staff writer at The New Yorker magazine, a distinguished writer in residence at Bard, award-winning Russian-American journalist, author of numerous books, including most recently Surviving Autocracy. Masha's most recent piece for The New Yorker is headlined In the Shadow of the Holocaust, How the Politics of Memory in Europe Obscures What We See in Israel and Gaza Today. We'll link to it at Democracy now.org. Masha Gessen has been speaking to us from Bremen, Germany, where they will be receiving um, the Hannah Arendt Award, albeit at a different venue, not sponsored by as many organizations that originally were sponsoring that award.